Good evening, everybody, um, and welcome. Um, just in the chat, um, if you could just tell us where you're from in the, in the world and what you love about social work. And if you're not actually in social work practice yet and you're a student, what you loved enough about social work to start studying it. So welcome to everyone that's just slowly joining just now. Uh, the slide that's on at the moment, we felt it was important to have two images because we were supposed to have Yusuf with us, who we mentioned a few weeks ago, sadly passed away. Uh, the top right hand corner is a piece of Yusuf's artwork, putting love into social work. And I don't think you can, the, the message isn't any more simple, you know, take your love and just put it right there. And that's everything he did. Even Yusuf was involved in this uh, care experience conference, which is on the left. And <clears throat> he was an incredible, he was an integral part of designing and having the conference. These are the top 10 messages that came out of the conference. The conference was uh, a day long event in Liverpool and it's seen um, care experience people from the ages of 10 up to 80 uh, coming from all over the country um, to discuss issues they felt was important to them. And one of the um, main seminar discussions was around love and care. Um, the top 10 messages that come from that are all there. They're incredibly powerful. If you type in Care Experience Conference into Google, these will come up. Um, but the number one um, message that came from, the, from, from all of the, the messages on that day was that we need more love in the system, but also including displays of positive physical affection. I thought we felt that was really powerful and just worth mentioning because you know, it's obviously some people will have experience of positive love and affection and care and out of it, but it's still a discussion that needs to be had. So, yeah, it was very powerful. And um, just obviously he's passed away, but thank you to Yusuf for his wonderful artwork. So we're going to move on. Um, we're hoping that tonight we're going to talk about a revolution of love in social work. Um, and the first of our guests is Dr. Sarah Ryan. Um, so Sarah, are you available to put your mic on and I will hopefully click your PowerPoint at the right time. Over to you, Sarah. Cool. Um, hi, everybody. And thanks for inviting me to this session. Um, I don't know whether many of you know or any of you know about our son, Connor, um, who I'm going to be talking about this evening. Um, and and how what happened to him and and our family has has made me reflect quite a lot on how love empty social work can be, or it certainly was in our experience. So if we go to the first slide. I just wanted to start by saying I'm a sociologist by background, and C. Wright Mills has written this uh, classic text called A Sociological Imagination, which is really worth. A read I think as a sort of alternative a set of something alternative for you to read because he's he, he includes some really interesting reflections on social life and one of the distinctions he makes is between what he calls personal troubles which is something that's part of the person it's like a failing in them as it were um sort of like I don't I'm trying to think of what an example would be of, of, of personal trouble because when you start to unpack it carefully you get to see and if I could have the next slide that the, the distinction he makes is between personal troubles and public issues and public issues are issues that are it should be important to all of us and that matter to us as a society so when you start to think about this distinction between personal troubles individual failings or deficit and public issues you can sort of see like the Daily Mail is very much a personal trouble sort of type lens in their reporting that, that the individual's flawed somehow and it's all their fault but they're smoking 40 fags a day or they did whatever when in actual fact these things are public issues and it was interesting that this morning there was I can't remember who it was on Twitter sort of highlighting the, the winter death sort of numbers are, are, are largely attributable to poor housing and, and lack of heating and that sort of thing more social issues so I just wanted to bring this this distinction into this talk as a sort of foundation point really so if we go to the next slide um what this leads to, this, this um, focus on personal issues, is means the bar of what is considered to be good is impossibly low in certain contexts. And if you're somebody with a learning disability in particular, alongside other, other um, marginalised groups, then what, what is it considered to be good is actually really low. So I wanted to go back a bit and tell you a bit about our family. Um, so on the next slide, you can see pictures. We had five children. Um, all together and you can see Connor there in the blue cardigan at the top with his um, sister Rosie hugging him, they're both sitting in a cardboard box. 
And underneath that, you've got a photo, um, the one professional photo we ever had of the kids, which was um, for Rich's birthday, my partner. And you can see there's Owen at the far end with Rosie. There's Will with little Tom on his back. And there's Connor um, lying there next to them. And this took this photo shoot, shoot, shoot took ages because Connor was quite unruly. And he's actually in that final picture, which was the picture that made the cut playing with handcuffs because he's quite obsessed with the police, the police force. So there you've just got a family with all sorts of children um, all rubbing on like puppies. And in a lot of photos, you can see that Connor in particular is often being hugged by his brothers and sisters. So if we go to the next slide, I'm hoping we'll be able to see a, a film shortly. So there's Connor up on Hergis Ridge with one of our dogs, Bess. In the background is Tom and a mate of his. And again, you can just see this just like they're just a group of children and they're just on holiday. And that's that's what we did. Okay, so that was just a just a collection of photos because I was so struck after Connor died how how um, the contrast between the love within our family, the love within friends, and um, other wider family relatives um, was in contrast to the sort of social care that that we received. So that was that was quite quite striking because at the time I didn't notice because it was just what we did. I mean that's just the photos we took. Next slide. There's an example here from. One of the blog posts I wrote, just as an example, it was Connor came home with his individual education plan. The first target was to introduce himself. And then you can see this piece of script here, which was Tom and I at, at, at tea time trying to sort of say to Connor, OK, let's practice this introducing yourself. Let's pretend you don't know us. And what would you say? So Tom and I run through that. And then we sort of say, OK, Tom, your turn. Uh, Connor, your turn or laughing boy, as we called him. You've bumped into me in a shop. What do you say? And Connor just said without missing a beat, hello, mum which was really funny. And there's so many funny experiences like this in the blog. So the blog actually generated quite a readership, despite it being just an anonymous set of casual reflections, probably based on sociological sort of thinking, I suppose. So we go on to the next. So, so actually, before we go on to the next slide, oh no, go on to the next slide, sorry, quite tricky to, to do this. So, so what happened, this is Connor on our last family holidays, walking miles behind us, holding his his, um, what do you call it, his um, iPod thing, listening to music. He had about 160 playlists with a different song on each playlist, which he spent ages producing. Um, and what happened when Connor turned 18, he became uncharacteristically unhappy, really distressed, really unlike himself. And um, in the end, after all sorts of things happened, we admitted him to a local assessment and treatment unit that we didn't even know existed. Social care, wash their hands you know the, the crisis line was surprised that we'd even run pretty much um so we took Connor to this unit that we were led to believe was a specialist unit that would help him for over two or three weeks treat and assess him so work out why he got so unhappy and then he'd come back home and he was going to carry on going to school from there as it turned out he was sectioned on the first night unsurprisingly with retrospect and by this point families are so stressed you are so at the edge of there, there is nobody to help and you know, looking back now, the hindsight, the way to hindsight is quite crushing. Um, but at the time, there seemed no alternative. Uh, Connor was getting quite violent. His younger brother was 13. 
he was becoming quite threatening and so he was submitted to this unit and then after 107 days of no assessment and the only treatment changing his medica medication he had epilepsy he um drowned in the bath while two support workers were doing a tesco's order in an office that was about eight feet from the bathroom so that that was um what happened there then Obviously, complete and utter devastation. And on the next slide, you can see that the NHS Trust, because it was actually an NHS Trust run unit, it wasn't even like one of these private providers um, that have a terrible reputation. The NHS Trust instantly moved into saying, well, Connor died of natural causes, which was sort of a real shock to us and completely ludicrous because, of course, 18 year old young men don't just suddenly die. And if they do die, then they're not. The, the weight of investigation and scrutiny should should happen. Um, so then we found in the board minutes um, two weeks later, they'd actually recorded this publicly that Connor had died of natural causes. And in the meantime, some legal health human rights lawyers got in touch, solicitors, barristers, because they'd been following the blog and they were so shocked by what had happened. And they started to gently nudge us into understanding that things would not be um, investigated as we had was assumed, and then quite possibly the NHS was not going to, like many public sector bodies, um, do the, what you would normally expect them to do. Um, so if you go on to the next slide, we then had a, a space of five years of investigations, which included um, a whole spate of obstruction, deceit, lies, that it, it was appalling. And part of this strand, which is obviously very familiar practice, um, was was blaming me in particular, blaming all of us. Um, but the, the whole weight, the local authority, the NHS, every every body that you would think would step up and sort of say, you know, Jesus Christ, you know, that this is we have just allowed, we've just let somebody die, or, or we've killed them even. We must look after this family. In fact, the 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 the, the knives come out and um, you experience as a parent a terrible sort of process of blaming and it's worth pointing out here that obviously I've, you know I've got a good job we've got a lot of resources in terms of being able to read reports and be familiar with lots of stuff and a, and a hell of a lot of people would not have that sort of capital as it were social capital to 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 be able to fight back and I've got the hide of a rhino which is probably quite helpful because if we go on to the next slide, you can see some examples of, of, of what happened. A, a commissioner sort of sent a letter sort of saying how I'd damaged trust in the in the county through my campaigning and, and all sorts of things around how difficult I was and so toxic. Um, and that's the thing that when you get people, when you've got parents who've come through the system for 20 years and they understand that there's going to be a chasm there with no support and they start to say, hang on, I, you know, what's going to happen what's what's my son's future what's my daughter's future it's a bit too easy for for social workers and social care and health professionals to turn around and sort of say well this is a really difficult person you know this is a difficult woman so if we go on to the next slide um this this sort of smearing carried on sort of low level and then higher level um, even we even got an, a, I got a phone message left at work with this member of staff sort of saying, so I'm really sorry that Connor died, but you're such a vindictive gal. <laughs> um, so that was so quite shocking. So there's all this abuse that you face as a parent. So if we go on to the next slide. Um, actually, if we go back just one second, just the, on, on that. Oh no, that's fine. We'll go forward again, sorry. So what happened eventually was there was an inquest, there was a police investigation, Norman Lamb stepped in and, and sort of whooped the health and safety executive to say that you should really be investigating this as criminal prosecution. You know, that you can't have a young man drown in a bath in a hospital unit. This is so wrong. As we knew on the morning it happened, obviously it's, it's beyond wrong. Um, and eventually after five years, there was an H health and safety executive prosecution Oxford Criminal Court and the trust pleaded guilty before the, the health and safety executive had even come up with charges. By that point they'd had a change in senior personnel and they just wanted to get shot the whole thing. And what was interesting was that we were told that the trust would be fined but the fine would be low because it's an NHS um, organised, an NHS body obviously, um, public money and all the rest of it despite this NHS trust spending 
literally hundreds of thousands of pounds trying to to stop us finding out what happened to Connor. And then on the day of the judgment, the judge ruled that uh, that, um, the trust was going to be fined two million pounds, which was the biggest fine in the history of the NHS. And this was for Connor's death. And another patient who died two or three years before him and her death alone should have prevented what happened to Connor if they'd actually acted on on the neglect and the errors that were made there. So the whole thing was a terrible catalogue of of woeful action, inaction, and and every negative thing that came with that. So if we go on to the next slide, it gets a bit more cheerful because what happened was because I was writing the blog, I wrote the morning Connor died, I just put a one line on the blog saying he's died and the police would be involved, which he would love, which he would have done. And through social media, we started sort of campaigning because we had to raise the money to pay for the our legal representation at Connor's inquest because the public have to pay for their own. And it's around 25 grand, which of course most families don't have lying around. And so we started selling postcards of Connor's art and people started doing activities. So if we go on to the next slide, I can only touch upon these because we've only got a few minutes. Um, people started sending in pictures of buses that they drew. Young children were drawing pictures of buses. We have masses of bus pictures. Um, so moving, lots of them sort of like customised with, with Connor's name on or whatever or a message. So we had all these pictures. And then on the next slide, we have. People held fundraising events. You can see a cardboard bus in the top right corner, I think it is, where a family made it out of Tesco's boxes, took a photo of themselves in it. Bottom underneath that is a flag at Glastonbury with Connor's photo on, hashtag justice for LB. Um, It was even on the BBC front page, that was. We held parties to raise money, you know, selling the tickets. Somebody made those bus cakes with his... Connor's face is on the front of these bus cakes. I mean, what, what people stepped up and did was extraordinary and it was coated in love. And that's that the contrast between the lack of love, the lack of care, the lack of interest, the complete disposal of a human being, and then the love that was generated by people who had never met us, never met Connor, was extraordinary. And then on the next slide, we then took, and this was this was just unbelievable, we crowdsourced um, to take the bus to take some people with learning disabilities to walk on the Camino because we thought we'd walk with the bus and um, just remember Connor really. And we crowdsourced the money in about two days for their three people with learning disabilities, two support workers, um, their passports because they didn't have passports and um, their flights, their accommodation. And we went and walked the Camino and and despite some people starting to ask us, you can't do that because you haven't got a risk assessment. What, what where's your support vehicle? all these questions, all these obstacles that people raised. And we just sort of said, well, we're just going to go for a walk. You know, this is a holiday. And so the um, it was members of My Life, My Choice, a local self-advocacy group that I work with. We walked every day and you can see at the bottom there, even Spanish telly. We were filmed on Spanish television because Spanish people could not understand what had happened. They just couldn't get their heads around somebody who'd been left to drown in a bar in, in an institution, basically, when they were 18. So that was a spectacular experience. These are all on, if you look online, if you Google Justice for Elby, you can see all these days of action that people did. That was extraordinary. And then the next slide. So I just sort of wanted to round up with a few thoughts around what what this might mean for you and your practice, as as I'm assuming it's a whole load of social work students or social work people out there. Um, If you turn over again to the next slide, I think, there's some key sort of there's some key principles that should underpin social work practice should underpin all our practice and this comes back to the personal issues and private public issues and personal troubles private troubles because as good citizens we should all act with thoughtfulness understanding knowledge integrity action and transparency and honesty if we all did this we wouldn't be in the mess we're in right now in this country with with so much shit going on um, certainly in social work practice, I think that, that really holding on to these these, char- these values and making sure that they guide your practice, making sure that you're forever checking, have I slipped into this sort of like not really caring, not really thinking, not really seeing the human in front of me. And the other thing that happened from Connor was that that we were stripped away as soon as he died, or even when he was alive, in all the records we got after, he was just an atomised body. He was just somebody who was a burden. He needed a budget. He needed this. He needed that. 
and we were stripped away as a family and and, and they peeled peeled us away from him which allowed him to be treated in the way he was treated and this is where i think this tonight's seminar is so important and then on the next slide um in practice the next slide um these things i was just sort of thinking you've got to listen you've got to reflect you've got to avoid jargon jargon is such a divisive tool it's such a power thing it's really um it's really difficult as a parent i've been in so many meetings when connor was young and jargon is spoken about and i would just be sitting there just crying inside because i just think i have no idea what you're talking about why are you doing this stay grounded call out shy don't will do not walk away from something that is so unacceptable because it's become acceptable in in, in, in around your practice colleagues don't treat families as enemies even if you've got a stroppy cow weeping around what's going to happen it doesn't make them an enemy it makes them a family a parent or a sister or a grandparent who is floundering and and if you if you listen to them and don't treat them as an enemy, then your job will become easier because you will learn how to better support everybody involved. And finally, or well, second, second finally, don't forget love and humanity should be at the heart of social work practice. And um, it really should be. It's not even mentioned on social work courses, I don't think. And I think the revolution in love that, that mentioned at the beginning is such a core thing that, that everybody should be thinking about. And then finally, we all have a right to an imagined future. When Connor died, there was no BBC coverage. He didn't get on the national news for sort of eight months, whereas a, a, somebody on a gap year or whatever, stumbling off a mountain or some terrible accident happening, they get front page news. It's everybody has a right to think about what sort of future they want. And that gets too often erased. And then finally, Siobhan's picture here. I think Siobhan came up with this, the why box, because Connor always said why. Why? Why? Always ask why. And, they, and he always asks why. And it's such a useful way to lead your life. And one final slide. He's, I've written two books now and I thought I'd flag them up for you. First one is about what happened to Connor. And then the second one is a, is a beautiful set of funny, interesting um, things about practice. So that's me done. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I think the links for those books should be in the chat round about now. Um, so if you haven't read those, please, please do read them. Um, thank you for that. Really, really powerful. Um, we really do appreciate you sharing, sharing that information. Um, so, yeah, I think it is really important, you know, to bring professional love back onto the agenda. Um, and I really hope that those of you listening tonight at home, you will read some of those books. You will look at the links that Sarah suggested um, and really think about that because it's, I know it's definitely something I'll be doing. And so our next speaker um, that we have is Shaz. Now, Shaz is going to talk to us about so-called honour-based abuse and forced marriage. Um, Shaz will be sharing a lot of her personal experiences, as Sarah has. Um, if you do need to step away, please do that. Please do look after yourself and please don't share anything outside of this presentation. It's the question asks if you were going to redesign assessment and the treatment team services, what would they look like? Uh, that's a really I mean, that's a really good question, because some of Connor's peers right now sort of need an environment in which they're really, really given specialist help. But what we've got is these assessment and treatment units that are just cash cows for private providers or done very poorly by the NHS. And they create problems, they generate problems, because the minute you've, you put somebody in a situation that is so brutal, so unfamiliar to them, then they're going to kick off and then the whole thing escalates and you've got this downward spiral. Having said that, and, and this has been quite a big discussion, well, it's not been as big a discussion as it should have been, but this idea, shut all the units, you know, everybody should be in their community. Of course, everybody should be in their community. Nobody should be in a specialist unit. But for different sorts of health issues, there are specialist units. And I know that there's um, like specialist eating disorder clinics. Some of them are really crap and they're shit and they should be closed down. But there are some good ones. And I always sort of thought like where Connor was, it's a massive space. There's so much, so much grounds there. It had a garden. You, you do it up really nicely. So it's a really spectacular environment. It's not a horrible institutional sort of like the ATU type stuff we see like St Andrews. You put the trampolines in, you put the Wi-Fi in, you get the top-notch staff to come in. 
for a small number of people across the UK. And it doesn't matter if it's a long way from home because it's such good, you know, it's such a good service that it does the job. And so um, somebody I know whose daughter was had an eating disorder went and traveled to an eating disorder unit that was a top unit and they, you know, treated her illness and she's now, you know, doing what she's doing, you know, she's living her life. So we've got to get rid of all the layers and layers of shit stuff that is literally just about making money. The, the, the fees are ridiculous. You could stay at the Ritz in a, in a penthouse suite at the Ritz for the cost of some of these places. And yet you're fed pig swill you're just locked up, you're in seclusion, you're drugged, you get no treatment. You know, so I think that we just need a very few, a small number of bespoke, spectacular units that people every now and again might need to go into. But again, that, that would be a, a sort of, they would slowly eke out because when people are happy and they're doing what they want to do, they're not being stopped from doing what they want to do, but everybody around them, around them understands what makes them happy and content then there isn't, these issues don't happen. It's, it's, we're so far from that, that, that that's why these places are sort of still needed. Bit of a long answer, sorry. That was a brilliant answer, thank you. And um, we've got about 10 minutes left before we're gonna wrap up. So has anybody else got any questions? Okay, so Lillian's just put a question in, um, asking if it's the workers' inability to manage relationships risks as part of the problem with expressing professional love i think you i don't know because i'm not i don't know much about the social work curriculum but i think that you're probably taught to not get too close to people not be you know that there are artificial boundaries are put in place like in the spanish example you know that there isn't that sort of professional person sort of set up and so there's there's just a genuine engagement with people what do you like doing hanging out with people understanding you know that Connor might have loved bus timetables you only had to speak to him about the bus timetables to Oxford and back to um really get his attention and, and engage with him but people didn't do that because they couldn't see beyond the jargon beyond that we have to do this this is an assessment we need to tick this box so I think it's I think it's part partly the way that social work is is structured and I think it's partly habit and I think it's partly not really seeing that this is a, a family of people with loved family members the, the the siblings are never used as a resource you know there's all sorts of things going on here that we've got so far from 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 what things should be that it's difficult to unpack that and I would recommend reading Simon Jarrow's book Those That Were Idiots that came out a couple of weeks ago because that's got a really good history of learning disability and showing a couple of hundred years ago everybody just got on with it and there was no you know we all mucked in together and that's where we should be now but we've, we've gone completely off piste. Can you just repeat the title of that book so um, we... those they were idiots I can show you it. Well, Lovely. Actually, probably better not. <laughs> 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 um, by Simon Jarrow, J-A-R-R-O-W. It's, it's a really lovely read. It's, he's gone back and done a historical plotting right up to today really it's 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 a really good book but it's quite shocking I felt quite upset reading it at how wrong we've gone basically with the advent of science okay just having a look to see if there's any other questions that have come in so Lindsay has um asked if you feel that social workers are afraid to, sh to, to show too much care um in in case it upsets families I'm not sure how it would upset families, <laughs> to be honest. I mean, these are really basic things, like just, just the, the children's social worker that Connor had was very human. She loved him. She thought he was hilarious. She didn't see him very often, but but she just she just saw it. But I think there's something about adult services where you stop seeing a child and you start seeing a problem. And I understand, you know, the, the social worker was so overworked. You know, she, well, she had, she was off sick a lot of the time. But there was a brutality about her practice that, that was really quite striking. And I sort of think if she just sort of said, she'd rung every now and again, how are you doing? How are you? I mean, there's such basic things to do to make families feel less isolated. And instead the wall comes down, the, the problems there, you know, the, the, the jargons there, terrifying families even more. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a really to it is a toxic mix, but sadly it's always the families that are painted as the toxic ones. And I think it's much more of an interaction thing. Um, there's a qu question in the in the chat. Sorry, Kat. Just sure. we lose it. Um, from Tammy, and she's asking, "How was the support for Connor leading up to his sectioning?" Um, 
what were you left to get on with it or was the school support good and stuff like the that? School support, the school could not have done more. I mean, that's you know, the school support was superb for Connor and they tried to work with social services. It, it was very much a sort of we were left to deal with it. The school nurse was brilliant. You reach a point where you can't deal with it anymore. And so that I rang the crisis line that the social worker had left me because she was on the evil off sick. And the, the crisis line was just like, yeah, sorry, leave your number. We'll get back to you after the weekend. And you, and you sort of think if the crisis line doesn't help, where, where what are you left with? And, yeah. you know, that, Definitely. so that's, that's, there, there was no support. And there was no support really once he was in the, in the unit either. There was, there was a positive support. So he sort of cut off after he was, okay, that, thank you. Thank you. I mean, obviously, we have a lot of um, social work students within this forum and newly qualified social workers. What are your what advice would you give them in working with families and being in situations that you've you've been through? And what is it that families need? I think it's, I think my advice would be always try and stay in the shoes of the people you're working with and try and sort of think, well, if somebody rang, you know, if a, if a member of your family rang you in, in, in absolute floods of tears and said X, Y and Z, would you really just sort of say, well, we, you know, we'll call you back on Monday. And I think this slide that's on the, on the screen there, I mean, obviously you do have to have boundaries and your job is really difficult and it is very messy. But unfortunately, it's there seems to be a drift too far from just sort of thinking, you know, this is these these are human beings, you know, this, these are people, these are families. So I think, yeah, that's a good slide that, but I think too often, I think it's easier to err on the side of caution and then it's too easy to drift away from, you know, you have your then your professional hat on and you stop seeing what you should really be seeing and it becomes a personal, personal trouble rather than a public issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing. I think everybody has um, really in, enjoyed listening to you tonight and they're definitely going to be looking at the books that you've, you've recommended. So we appreciate you coming along. For those of you that haven't read this book, Social Work, Cats and Rocket Science, um, I really would recommend it. It is, it is a recommendation of the team. And I know that you, you are in contact with these people, Sarah. Um, absolutely fantastic book mm -hmm. along with Sarah's with lots of individual stories of making a difference on a lot of a lot of things in the chat I've said but how can we do that or um would you give any, any examples I would say that in this book there are lots lots and lots of examples especially chapter four on love hope and relationships um so I believe the team should be putting that in the chat now um and then as always we do have webinars coming up so I'll leave you to read that um, thank you so much for our guest speakers. Um, we will invite Shaz back for another webinar. Um, I've got a feeling that we'll be inviting you back as well, Sarah. So um, <laughs> keep an eye on your inbox because people always want more. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye.